Each year, the end of autumn marks the start of a remarkable journey. The epitome of perseverance. From the open oceans to small freshwater rivers. Countless salmon return to their birthplace, swimming against the currents, overcoming all obstacles in their path. With incredible strength, they leap over waterfalls, even slipping past predators. This journey may take up to several weeks, sometimes spanning hundreds of miles. And once the salmon reach their spawning grounds, the upstream battle ends and the mating quickly begins. Females lay their eggs in gravel beds before the males fertilize them, each nest containing over thousands. But the great migration comes with an even greater sacrifice. When the breeding frenzy is all said and done, the Pacific salmon waste away and eventually their dead bodies line the riverbanks during a season that ends in both life and death. Most organisms can afford the freedom to breed year after year but some are only offered a single opportunity. Pacific salmon live by this lifestyle known as semilparity, where mating ultimately leads to death. And so they invest all their efforts into a final act. As they make their journey home, salmon undergo vast changes. Their silver sides blush with browns and reds, Females swell into vessels for carrying plump eggs, while males grow fearsome hooks for battling against rivals. And the changes towards the end of their lives are just as profound. Once in fresh water, there is little food to eat, and after using every ounce of energy, the salmon slowly die, flesh rotting away like fish of the living dead. The decay is driven by high levels of cortisol, a stress hormone. Mating is stressful work, a brutal assault on their bodies, and this also suppresses their immune systems, leaving them vulnerable to diseases and parasites. By the end of their spawning season, up to 95% lay to rest in the riverbeds. And yet still, their commitment is unwavering. The evolutionary journey of semilparity starts with homing, a behavior where adults return to their birthplace to breed. Homing is common in migratory fish, Habitats suitable for breeding can be difficult to find. Some waters just aren't safe enough, while others are too cold or too warm with too little food. For fish, sometimes there is no simpler option than to reproduce at the same site as their parents, a place they are already familiar with, where they themselves are a living testament to its success. Salmon are incredibly adapted for homing. They navigate the open oceans by using the Earth's magnetic field as a compass. Once in coastal waters, the imprinted smell and taste of their home river takes over and guides them to the very areas their own lives began. 
in ancient salmon, this journey may have been much shorter, as they initially remained closer to spawning sites, before migrating further away over generations. Homing may have been a pre-adaptation that drove the evolution of anadromy, where fish live in the sea as adults and migrate to freshwater to spawn. In the salmon family, anadromy evolved at least twice from fully freshwater ancestors. It likely arose due to a genomic duplication event occurring at least 50 million years prior. These new genes enabled ancient salmon to tolerate salt water, freeing them from their small freshwater homes to explore the big open oceans. During the late Oligocene, around 30 million years ago, the oceans began to cool. Cooler waters improve food productivity, and ancient salmon may have taken to anadromy to exploit these greater marine resources. Modern salmon divide their lives between freshwater and saltwater. Born in freshwater, they live in rivers for up to three years before travelling downstream to the oceans where they mature. After around seven years, they return to the rivers to spawn. This lifestyle presents the best of both worlds. With fewer large predators, the freshwater world is much safer for eggs and young fish. While the marine world offers a larger menu of food, so maturing adults can grow to larger sizes. From this, reproductive death eventually evolved around 11 million years ago, and it hinged on the huge cost of migration. Selection may have favoured fish that paid a higher price. Those that reached the breeding grounds sooner could establish better territories and spawn the most young. Slower fish, too concerned with feeding, were simply outcompeted. Over time, selection pushed this race to dangerous limits, so much that death became inevitable for Pacific salmon. But not all fish face this fate. The Atlantic salmon also endure long migrations, without chasing death, surviving even after spawning. The two lineages diverged around 15 million years ago, long before the origins of semilparity. In the Pacific lineage, it was the increase in egg size that truly drove the evolution. Usually, fish compromise between egg size and number, but semilparous species are greedy, indulging in both to maximise their mating efforts. Larger eggs produce larger young that grow faster, which increases their survival. And this only added to the cost of reproduction, a sacrifice that ultimately sealed their fate. Over generations, reproductive death has become so programmed into salmon that even landlocked populations still die after spawning. In the Okanagan Lakes of Canada, some schools of sockeye salmon are completely enclosed by land, unable to make the long migrations. Although these fish spend their entire lives in fresh water, they still take to mating with the same intensity as their seagoing brethren, even paying the same price.
Still, for these specific salmon, death is not the end. They continue to give life long after they die. In these graveyards, the dead act as natural fertilizers, releasing nutrients into the streams. They serve as fodder for scavenging insects, and in an odd twist of fate, these same insects feed the next generation of salmon. Many carcasses float through the woods, where they enhance plant life and the greenery grows greener. Others make it back to the oceans, returning some of the nutrients used to fuel their great migrations. So the cycle of reproductive death can live on.